As he rode along, the Bible says, people kept spreading their cloaks on the road, and as he was now approaching the path down from the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of the disciples began to praise God with a loud voice for all the deeds of power that they had seen. The whole multitude of the disciples began to praise God with a loud voice for all the deeds of power that they had seen. Now, one of the things I like about Palm Sunday is that it has this great central story that I think you all probably remember. It appears in all four Gospels, which, as you know, is not the case for some other, and sorry, lesser holidays like Christmas. And it tells the story of a parade, a joyous protest march, a religious pilgrimage to an occupied city. It is a moment in the Bible that is filled with life, in a way that life in the presence of loss and death feels so full. Now, in some ways, this holiday is more interesting than Easter. Some ways. Not that I don't like resurrections, large or small, literal or metaphorical, for resurrection is what we all look for in times of need. But, but, they say that number two tries harder. And that is Palm Sunday. And there is something compellingly human, compellingly human about this scene, something deeply hopeful in spite of everything. In each of the Gospels, the story is essentially the same. Jesus, his followers, and others join in the march to the gates of Jerusalem for the festival of Passover. They sing songs, they dance, they make the sort of racket one might expect in a festival crowd. However, however, the Jerusalem they are approaching doesn't hold the promise that they aspire to. It doesn't hold the promise they aspire to, and they know it. They know it. But they sing anyway, praising God with a loud voice, the Bible says. Now, when I think of this story, this image of a march or a parade up to the gates of a troubled city whose rulers do not want them, it is hard not to think of our southern border, where people make the trek from places like Guatemala and Honduras to our own gates, and they are filled with hope as well. These travelers, these migrants and refugees and pilgrims of today, they too know they know that the gates may be closed, and that even if they somehow gain entry, that life will be hard. Those that oppose them, after all, are very, very loud people, and can be seen and heard on social media and in the news every single moment of every day. But, but the people sing Anyway, at least when they can. For in the end, in the end, hope may be all that we have. Now, it's also hard not to think of the suffering of friends, of loved ones, and even ourselves in the face of anxiety about the future. Anxiety about surgeries or illnesses, financial crises, personal and general, conflicts that must be confronted in our lives, and yes, the inevitability of death. But, but we still celebrate when we can, too. And we do so amidst the pain and doubt that surrounds us. Now, the people in our Palm Sunday stories sing these songs and take this march to Jerusalem in the midst of their own trials and suffering. 
The purpose of this day and of the week itself is to recognize that that reality, both in our lives and in theirs, and to move on anyway, in spite of the forces pushing us back in place, tiring us out, moving us toward resignation or despair. In the King's Chapel Book of Common Prayer that we use at burial services in this congregation, there is a particular prayer that refers to the sure and certain hope. You may have heard it. The sure and certain hope of the resurrection to eternal life when they that sleep in the death of the body awaken in the life of the Spirit according to the mighty working whereby God is able to subdue all things. That sure and certain hope. Well, it's pretty hard to maintain, isn't it? It's pretty hard to maintain in a world that wants to take it from us. A world that wants to control us, to stoke our fears. Our fears of each other, our fears of loss, our fears of change. Admiral Tarkin... Y'all know who he is? In Star Wars? Grandma. What? You got the title wrong. Grand Moff. You're, you are correct. Former Admiral, that, that time, Grand Moff Tarkin, in the movie Star Wars, who was never once one to mince words, he tells us that fear will keep the local systems in line. Do you remember that? Some of you will remember that. Fear will keep the local systems in line, he says. And so it does. It does at the border and in our cities and in towns and in our hearts. We know what Caesar wants. We know what Caesar wants, says Roger Cowan in our reading today. Testing ranges and new arenas while the homeless haunt church basements and the poor shuffle in the streets. It is Caesar's week. It is Caesar's week, he says. It is Caesar's week. Now, it might have taken a bit of gallows humor way back when to have named the time ahead of us Holy Week instead. In a way, it makes sense, of course. In the high church tradition, such as Roman Catholicism, this week contains many of the big holidays. Palm Sunday, Maundy Thursday, and Good Friday. But the holiness of this time may not exactly be all that clear. For from this Palm Sunday moment, this parade, this march, things get harder for Jesus. And they get harder for his followers as well. Again, we can think of those infamous detention facilities in our own country, both at the border and elsewhere, as well as the dark prisons we find ourselves in from time to time. Palm Sunday and Holy Week are holy, but they are holy in spite of Caesar and Caesar's minions. In spite of a power that wants to set us apart from each other, that creates crises and then expects us to succumb to them, to give up a part of our humanity because of the crises it creates. In addition to Palm Sunday, the story of Holy Week includes another protest, the throwing out of the money changers from the temple, and then Jesus' arrest, torture, and death. And by paying attention during this time, by paying attention, we, we fellow humans on this earth are meant to see the role that we play. The role we play in today's version of the story. When we examine our lives in the light of Holy Week, we find that sometimes we are Jesus' followers. Ranging from the strong to the weak, beset by forces beyond our control. But sometimes we are Caesar, or we are the centurion, exacting our own domination over others. Or we are those thieves crucified with Jesus, one faithful, one judgmental. Or perhaps most often, 
most often we are Pontius Pilate, aren't we? Witnessing injustice and evil, but washing our hands clean, perhaps with a Facebook post. Holy Week is holy if we make it so. If we find ways to keep the faith in celebration, in confession, in resistance, and in sure and certain hope. Because, as Cowan points out, it may be Caesar's week, but it is God's world. It may be Caesar's week, but it is God's world. Lying underneath all that fear and all that suffering, all the power and pressure that is sent against us by forces that make us feel helpless, that make us hard where we should be soft, suspicious where we should be trusting, angry where we should be understanding, underneath all the dysfunction that we see in ourselves and in the world around us, lying underneath is God's world, the best world and the means towards the resurrection of our world. And so we are back. As we often find ourselves in Lent, we are back to the discipline of the spiritual life. A life that is as external as it is internal. A life of reflection and action and reflection and action again. So St. Patrick didn't actually write Thea Fiata. I summon all these powers to protect me against every cruel and wicked power that stands against me. But tradition says that he sang it to himself during some of the darkest moments of his life. And as we move through our own dark moments, we need to look to our own songs, our own prayers, to find ways to that joy which exists even in the darkest of times. For Jesus and his disciples, it was, Blessed is the one who comes in the name of God, peace in the highest heaven. And as we prepare to go out into this week, that is both Caesar's and God's, we should ask ourselves what song we will sing to keep the dark at bay. What song will we sing to keep the dark at bay? What will strengthen us? What will inspire us to act? What will keep us in sure and certain hope for whatever rebirth awaits us as individuals and as people in this place and time? Let us take a moment to think on these questions now in silent prayer and reflection.